And now, Jason, on, you, on your side as the you know strength coach there, when you're looking at the warm ups and seeing, and then communicating with Jazz, I mean, obviously you've got your plan on what you guys what you want the guys to do um, for their lifts and whatnot. But can you speak to a bit of you know what you might pick up on certain days and how you might call some audibles and change things up a little bit with your athletes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and it all starts you know the moment they walk into to the practice facility. Uh, we're, we're constantly watching just to see how they're moving, what their energy levels are like. Um, I'm constantly paying attention to who's on the table and uh, and even in particular what, what Jazz might be working on. And then for really starting with a warm-up, we do essentially the same warm-up almost every day. Sometimes we'll go back and forth between two slightly different warm-ups. But this allows us, as Jazz kind of alluded to, to determine athlete norms and, and, and how they typically move. And then uh, when they're getting away from those norms and and too far on one end of the spectrum, it starts to really stand out for both the coaches and the therapists, Um, whether it be a a technical issue or mechanical issue or fatigue levels, we're able to start picking up on these things and then make any adjustments that we may need to make. Uh, And then in the weight room, I think it, it helps tremendously that I'm at the track and, and the, the folks from the track are also in the weight room. So there's a ton of collaboration and it's, and it's truly integrated. And that way I know if they have a, a really big session on the track and a couple of particular athletes hit that session really hard and have a great day, there might be a little bit of residual fatigue once we get in the weight room. So maybe we'll adjust a little volume or, or switch some things around to accommodate for that. And are there certain things, can you walk us through a couple of the things in terms of your warm up, like in, for elite sprinters, are there um, some of the techniques that you guys use for the warm-up? Yeah, it's a pretty lengthy warm-up, uh, anywhere from, from 35 to, to 55 minutes. Um, we, we utilize kind of the same structure each day, and then we'll manipulate slightly within that. Uh, so we start with torso activation, just, just getting things fired up, um, fairly general in that regard, and then uh, work our way into some more specificity. We go in through dynamic mobility, where we're uh, just big, open, bouncy movements, getting them warm. On acceleration days, we'll add in some accelerations at a very low intensity in between each of those drills. Um, And that's anywhere from six to 12 drills there. Uh, Dynamic flexibility comes next, so it's a series of different leg swings, making sure we got full range of motion through through hips and shoulders and, and everything's moving smoothly. And then we get more specific into sprint drills. So a lot of AWOC variations, uh, high knee variations, whatever you want to call it, through different cadences and, and different environmental challenges. Uh, again, if it's an acceleration themed workout, we'll add some accelerations in between each of those drills just to allow for some additional repetition for those athletes and, uh, and hopefully some additional transfer from the drills to the sporting movement. And in terms of uh, sprinting, I mean, growing up when I was watching sprinting, we had, uh, you know, the Ben Johnsons, the Donovan Baileys of the world that were sort of a classic, what you would think of as a classic sprinter build. And of course, in the last decade with, you know, Usain Bolt and, you know, longer levers, taller. And, and now obviously you guys have the, you know, amazing young Canadian there, Andre DeGrasse down there, who's also a different, you know, sort of a more s- slight kind of whip it type uh type build so can you speak to a little bit of the different body types and maybe does that change at all in terms of what you're doing in the weight room uh how does that impact the sprinting yeah um so i'll speak to that maybe from a therapy standpoint um really what we what we see is is maybe two ends of the spectrum where i like to classify an athlete as being very mechanically driven so these are the guys that are are quite muscular and will use those um abilities to to their benefit and then on the other end of the spectrum, we have guys who are a little bit more fascially driven, and this is like Andre. So they're not they're not big and bulky, um, but they're they have this elastic component to them that allows them to to harness that energy and, and kind of you know transmit force uh, on the track, perhaps a little bit differently than someone who's mechanic. Now, of course, there's there's going to be hybrids of each, uh, and this example is really just to drive home the point. Uh, in addition to that. Anthropometrics have de- definitely changed. We have uh, some athletes who are, you know, quite, quite large, like taller, um, longer levers, and their their ability to transmit force is slightly different than, say, someone who's um, a little bit shorter. Um, so yeah, there, there definitely is a spectrum of, of athletes, and the way we we need to assess them perhaps becomes a little bit different um, depending on that. 
Gotcha. Yeah, that's, I mean, definitely, obviously, in basketball, we see that sort of tension being a big part of, uh, you know, lean guys being able to get up and being quick. So that's really interesting about, uh, you know, with Andre as well. Um, now, as we, you know, we've heard a lot from, from other coaches in terms of this idea of power being essential to learning the right sprinting technique and being almost more important than even the technique. Can you guys speak to that a little bit in, in, in your athletes? Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting topic. Um, and it reminds me of uh, a recent post that came out on Stu McMillan's blog with his strength series. And uh, an addition, additional part there from Jeremy Witherspoon, who's a speed skater, was a speed skater, now he's a coach in Norway. Um, arguably one of the greatest speed skaters of all time, but he, uh, he hypothesizes that his technique was, was so sound because he, he learned it without having any strength levels, essentially, with no background in training. Um, he wasn't able to just power through poor technique in order to be fast. It, it really re required that he had proper technique and he was applying force in the proper directions in order for him to be fast. And, and I thought it was a really interesting concept. Um, and then just to, to, br to bring it around, it's technique really trumps all, especially for us with the population that we're with. Um, these guys are already quite powerful and, and strong. The, the difference that's going to be made in, in their performance is going to come from, from changes in technique. So we have intense sessions with, uh, with a lot of coaching, and we're just trying to hone in on all these differences that we can make through, through the technical model. That's interesting. I mean, I've heard, um, you know, yeah, some of the experts like, you know, Derek Hansen mentioned that when he was sprinting at school, he'd put all his time in, in the gym, you know, Olympic lifts, really building up the, the amount of, of mass he could, he could move. And then, you know, the, the change in his total sprint time, I forget what he mentioned, but it, it dropped, you know, not nearly as much as he'd hoped with all that sort of, uh, gym work. Now, obviously gym work's important, but, um, can you talk about the balance there between, you know, developing power and speed without inherently having to, to move weights or, or using the track to do that? I'd say it comes from both, really. Um, but I think a common misconception is that is that you need to use weights, heavy weights, weights above 85% uh, in order to get strong and powerful. But in reality, dynamic effort lifts in the weight room will, will bring about those strength levels. And, and there may not be a lot of published research to show it, but there's a lot of anecdotal evidence from a lot of successful coaches who have implemented programs uh, really with, with very little emphasis on maximum strength. Uh, so I think, I think it's a spectrum really when it comes down to it. And with developing athletes, you might have an opportunity to find more performance gains by, by going from a strength approach. Uh, and then as they progress into more elite, taking more of a, a technical approach. But that being said, with the developing athletes, I think too many coaches ruin their long-term development by, by chasing these quick numbers, uh, whether that be through the weight room or, or on the track or the field or whatever it might be. So it's, I think it's a fine line and, and, it's a, and it's a difficult balance. But for us, it all, it all comes back to the, to the track. Yeah. So everything we do in the weight room is just to supplement the work that we're putting in on the track. I would say from a developing athlete standpoint, um, I, it's crucial to do a needs analysis to find out what specifically you think that athlete needs to address. Um, there's tons of, of research now that you know, supports the idea that maximum strength work is, is going to have uh, a translation onto you know, velocity and being able to sprint. But what we need to be careful of is you know, the populations that they're, they're actually using in these studies in addition to the long-term effects. So what are the longitudinal studies that show if you continue to work in the max end spectrum, what happens to say fiber lifts? Now, to my knowledge, there, there is no, no paper that shows that you start to get more oxidative qualities, which inherently to me mean the rate of force development is a little bit slower. However, the, the peak that you're gonna have in, from a force development standpoint is obviously going to increase. But where, where does that lie in your spectrum of what you're trying to um, look for in your athletes? So understanding that a needs analysis is going to be a key, I think is a big, 
a big takeaway for for coaches to, who are working with the uh, developing athlete. Yeah, that's some great advice because I know a lot of um, you know, especially young strength coaches, you know, chasing that that board, that PR or max lift board is is something that they often use as a way to assess the progress of a young athlete. And it sounds like from what you guys are saying that there's a obviously there's a place for that and it's important. But uh, you know, the more elite someone gets, then the more specific with their needs and of course even uh technique etc becomes trump's all right yeah Yeah, absolutely now in terms of your elite sprinters if we shift over to other areas of sort of performance leaks if we look at this integrative approach of whether it's um, things that you do on the recovery side things that we do on the nutritional side or or in terms of sleep etc um can you speak to any of the you know techniques or or things that you guys are implement uh, with your guys yeah, from a recovery standpoint, we, leave, we like to keep it quite basic, to be honest. Um, there, there's lots of things that we can do, um, but often just chasing low-hanging fruit is, is something that goes overlooked, perhaps, and I think sleep is one of those. Um, we would like to prescribe that each athlete has, uh, you know, at minimum, 70 hours of sleep a week, uh, and which doesn't seem like a, a task that should be difficult, but again, once you start working with, you know, uh, this age group, even even getting that can be sometimes a little bit of a challenge. Um, In addition to that, we do like to educate our athletes on proper nutritional choices. Um, We're fortunate that we have a series called Altis U in which uh, one of our coaching staff and it kind of rotates through, we'll we'll do a presentation for the athlete, uh, athletes rather, and it will kind of encompass uh, various topics, one of which would be nutrition, uh, one of which would be recovery uh, and and what they're doing, and what we're trying to accomplish with that is making uh, our athletes um, have actionable intelligence, and so they're not just going to go through this process and and not have any say or not really understand what they're doing and why they're doing it. Uh, I think increasing the athlete's uh, IQ as to what's involved in being a professional athlete is um, one of the more crucial things we can do. Um, anything you would want to add to that, Jason? I think it's, uh, it's it's sometimes it's challenging with some. Um, we see a lot of guys who are very on top of, of their lifestyle, and they're eating all the right things at the right times, and they're keeping sleep journals. Uh, and then and then we see elite athletes who eat burgers and fries and and stay up till two a.m. playing video games, and uh, but are still still good at their craft, still extremely good at their craft. So it's, a, it's an interesting topic, but, but our approach is just, as Jazz said, educate the athlete as much as we can, um, equip them with, with everything that they need in order to be successful, and then hope that in the uh, 18, 19 hours of the day that we're not with them, that they're doing the right things. You know, a common misconception you've highlighted in your work is people lumping all sprinting together as a one-dimensional linear effect you know you go on to describe how virtually every step from start through acceleration to maximum velocity offers you know different training effects can you walk listeners through that progression yeah i I think it's it's interesting that if you look at the data of some of the top performers and things like stride frequency stride length uh, ground contact time for the most part the only thing that stays pretty constant and some people get this wrong too, is, is stride frequency. And it's usually about four to five strides per second. So that's pretty constant. And I'll watch my kids run, you know, and you do the calculation in your head. I'm I'm not so obsessive that I'm like filming them and breaking down their stride frequency, (laughs) but, but you kind of see like, okay, they're turning over about the same frequency as, as an elite performer. The only difference is they're not putting as much force into the ground. And so the stride length is significantly shorter. Um, but when you look at stride length and you look at um, what's happening on the ground, every step gets a little more forceful and the ground contact time gets shorter. And a lot of the time it happens in pairs. So you'll see two strides are the same, then the next two are different, then the next two, obviously you got two legs and you know it works that way. But uh, the fact that you can have a ground contact time, I think uh, at block clearance, it could be as high as you know three tenths of a second. And then at the faster end, you're below a tenth of a second. You know, that's a pretty broad array of, of, of things that are happening and, and, you know, what's happening in the lower, lower chain in terms of knee flexion and 
heel recovery and, and, and what muscles are involved. I think that's pretty interesting. And from a re, if we go back to the rehab scenario, it, it doesn't look sexy, but getting people to accelerate um, covers a lot of bases. And if we kept things simple and, and again, you know, I, I assume that the caveman who, I don't know if he pulled his hamstring, but the caveman who got injured basically ran himself back into shape. Otherwise he'd die. You know, that, you know, if we fall back on that, then it gets pretty compelling to me. Yeah, that's very, very, very well said. Um, and if we dovetail this into elite performance, you know, when I think of speed, I think of football. Uh, you recently had some, some great content in your podcast of NFL players like, I think it was Tyreek Hill, you know, achieving max velocities around, what, 20.5, 21 miles an hour. Looks yep. like blazing speed. But you mentioned that these athletes have the potential for closer to 26 miles an hour. Um, you know, what are the opportunities for these ultra elite to improve and gain that sort of 15%? Yeah, I mean, if again, you know, it's it's not it's sort of apples and oranges and it isn't. But if you look at some of the top females, uh, they're getting up 24, 25 miles per hour at top speed. Um, so 20.8 on the football field might seem impressive, but they're really not getting close to what I think they're capable of doing. And does that mean they're capable of doing on the football field? Not necessarily, you know, because there's so many other factors in terms of equipment, fatigue and um, other people being in the way. So w should we get them up to 22 miles per hour on the field or 23? That would be nice. Um, but what ends up happening is during the week, uh, you know, they're practicing, they're doing all these different activities uh, everything gets watered down because if you have a two hour practice, you're not going to be hitting high speeds. And I always tell people if, if you and I, Mark got on a starting line and I said, we're racing to 30 yards, we're going to go all out, right? We're not going to leave anything in the tank. But if I said, we're going to do a marathon, I'm going to be walking off that line. Quite honestly, I'm not going to be, uh, you know, pushing myself. Um, so you know, knowing that I'm going into a two hour practice and I got to go through all these drills that we've gone through before, I will, you know, down regulate and I'm not going to push myself. So if the highest velocity I'm ever reaching in a game is 20.8 and I know that potentially I could go 26 on a track with spikes, that's that's a big gap in my opinion. Now, you know, how does that get resolved? Well, it'd be nice if you could do something intense during the week. Um that covers that does that mean you have to get on a track and sprint no but you should at least try to be accelerating um maybe you know a little bit beyond that that 20.8 or whatever it was uh, velocity having said that now you got to go back and you got to go to the off-season training and go are they actually hitting high velocities in off-season and i would argue that most of them probably aren't because you know you see what people do for training and it, you know, I'm, I'm not a huge speed ladder guy, but you see people go through speed ladders and their feet might be moving fast, but their bodies certainly aren't. And that's a problem. So if this is the base of your training that you're doing these little agility movements, moving your feet and tap dancing, that's great for Broadway, but it's not great. <laughs> it's, not, it's not great for the football field, right? Uh, at the highest level. So where does it come from? Where do you get this stimulus well you know sprinting is a good thing to do if you've done it in the off season uh for an extended period of time say like say you do it for 12 weeks which is what they used to train for um in the old days in the nfl you'd have you go to the facility and train for 12 weeks now it's like three or five um so if you're not putting in that time to sprint in the off season you should not be doing it in season now because you just haven't developed a base uh, a reserve of speed so it gets very difficult. You have to look at the entire season. And this is what I try to do when I work with teams is let's look at the big picture so that if we do these things properly in the off season, when it comes to the in season period, now you have more options to, to maintain qualities and maybe in advanced qualities. And that's, that's the biggest argument I put forward all the time. Absolutely. And you know, what, what are some of those factors then for coaches to consider when they're sort of micro dosing a high intensity work during the in season period, if you consider that in the off season, they've trained that up. Yeah. If they've trained it up, great. Now, you know, if somebody, uh, you know, if somebody's squatted 500 pounds in the off season, 
well, then it gets very interesting to work around 350 to, you know, to 425 or, you know, it all comes down to percentages and, and what, what you can work with. But if you've only squatted 200 pounds in the off season, you know, you're essentially doing body weight squats for the rest of the season, which isn't doing anything. It's not accomplishing anything. Like, um, I was just, you know, I just texting back and forth with Mark Uyama at the Vikings and they had a player go down and we're talking about the, if you watch the film of, um, I think his name's cook, last name's cook running back and he's running full bore. He cuts his leg collapses and, and, you know, he goes down and it's, it's going to probably be a full ACL repair that he needs at some point. But, you know, on turf at that velocity, I don't know what his body weight is. Um, that's pretty significant. And that's something that you have to prepare for. And it's not that it's probably not that he didn't prepare for it, but the demands placed on players nowadays running full speed and stopping on, I would say a surface that's not very forgiving with the, the cleats that they have and the, the coefficient of friction that they're encountering. Um, he could do that once he could do that twice. He might be able to do that 10 times in a game or 20 times in a practice. But, you know, he's he's uh, he's narrowing the margin, right? Like it's it's got to go at some point. You know, I, I don't think anybody's had to do that, you know, uh, in the past, whether it's people like um, Jim Brown or um, Walter Payton. They didn't have these same problems, right? Because the surface is different. The game was a little different. And now it's, you know, go as fast as you can. It might be 20 miles per hour. And then you have to stop on a dime and cut and get around people on a surface that's going to stop you. Uh, there's not going to be any slip. So I, I just think, how do we prepare for that? Um, and it, it's it's difficult. It's it's a, a lot of these teams are going to survive based on whether or not the roster is healthy. Um, and we saw that with the Patriots too, with one of their receivers going down. It's you know who can preserve the players and make them durable. I think that's going to be the limiting factor in with a lot of these teams' uh, futures. Definitely, I mean, staying healthy is so key, especially in contact sports like football. Uh, now, on the injury front, you know, how does high intensity sprinting help to protect the athletes from some of these soft tissue injuries, um, or can it expose them to potential risk? It, I mean, there's inherent risk in everything, obviously, and and so you're just trying to balance things off and say, okay, uh, can I get you know, we talked about that uh, 20 miles per hour is probably 80% of what their potential output is. Okay, do we need to go 100%? Well, no, we don't need to. We could probably go 90 or 95, and that's still way better than that 80. So by stripping off 5%, I think you've reduced risk significantly and prepared the athlete better. So if I'm sprinting at 95%, um, I'm still getting some pretty good ground contact times uh, in terms of you know short ground contact times and the amount of recruitment required. And I think sometimes working at 95%, um, you know, especially if you explain it to the athlete in terms of what 95% is, you can remove some of that extraneous tension in other muscle groups that may be opposing what you're trying to do, uh, learn how to operate at high velocities under a relaxed condition, and I think that in itself is going to make people more resilient, you know, um, working at higher outputs, learning to control yourself a little bit better, um, learning how to turn muscles on and off very quickly um, and not creating residual fatigue that's going to create problems later on, I think is, is pretty compelling. And again, unfortunately, it takes it takes some practice. It takes a lot of, uh, you know, personal time and involvement to learn how to coach these things properly and where to insert them and, and, and what volumes to use. And I think that's the biggest thing I'm asked is like, well, how much is enough? And it says, well, how much can they give me? Um, how much can I shave off? How much, the biggest one is how much time do we have time and energy actually, but a lot of the time it's time. Will the coach give us this extra time? Will the players allow us to use a, another 10 minutes of practice or you know is everybody just want to get the hell out of there <laughs> yeah so these there there's a whole logistical issue around doing this properly and football like many sports um has a lot of tradition and they like to do things a certain way and i think when you start looking at where are they getting value how many repetitions do they need to learn this play 
how many repetitions do they need to you know perfect things i think it's probably a lot less than people think but there's so much insecurity and i'm not saying insecurity like you know i don't i don't like myself it's it's insecurity like i got to win next week so I, I i keep my job and that that plays into it because now everybody thinks they have to do more or at least give the impression that they're putting in more time and effort um, so that they can retain their job. And that's, that's where things break down, I think, is if you can identify optimal or, you know, I don't know if optimal, but, but the best case scenarios for how much work I need for each individual element, um, you'll be in a better place. But, you know, just pushing for more and more and more is not the way to go. And we know this, right? So that, that's the message I'm trying to get across all the time is how do we do things better, not more? Yeah, it's amazing how taking context into account, you know, the athlete's sport, the, um, you know, the demands of the athlete as well. So in terms of practice, you know, you, in some of the research they're talking about procedural memory development. So how does this fit into the equation and how do we develop that, autom- that automation that we need to help athletes? That's a good question. I think it goes back to uh, sequencing. And when you look at the training process, and really if you kind of go back to those four tenants, you know, big four, short time, proper direction, and full range of motion. I think if you take a look at those four tenants and you look at where, uh, where they apply over the course of the training year, you could emphasize one of those four things at any given time of the training process. So um, if you take a look at it from the perspective of the training year, if you look at the training year, you have general preparation, specific preparation, pre-competition, main competition, taper, peak, and, and it kind of goes down the line, right? And Everybody, just regardless of the periodization of programming paradigm that you might subscribe to, I think everybody could almost universally agree that in the beginning of the off-season, during that general preparatory period, you're probably doing higher training volumes at lower intensities in the weight room. You know, most people are doing things strength endurance oriented, reps 8 to 12, somewhere, you know, 60 to 75 percent 1RM. And realistically, those things... Um, they influence the way that you produce force, right? So if you're looking at uh, big force in short time, what you do in the weight room drastically affects what your big force and short time uh, or how you're going to emphasize those qualities for speed. So for example, if you take a look at the general prep period, if you're doing sets of eight to 10, what is pretty much shown throughout the research universally is that those higher training volumes at lower intensities reduce an athlete's ability to produce rapid forces. So rate of force development, power, um, the ability to produce those rapid ground reaction forces isn't really um, all that evident after those training periods. That's not what those training periods are for. So those accumulation type training periods, um, they're used to basically get you ready to go to the more sports specific stuff. So I'm kind of getting towards your your procedural memory development. Um, if you're not going to wind up enhancing big force short time over that sort of a, a time period, it's probably a really good idea to teach the athlete to orient those forces in the proper direction in that time period. Because if you're taking the other two pieces of the puzzle, big force and short time, off the table because of what's going on in the weight room, you're going to have to make adjustments and accommodate and emphasize the things that can be focused on. Um, focusing on the athlete, what the athlete's set up to do rather than what the athlete isn't set up to do physiologically. So going towards uh, procedural memory development, I mean, really what that means is kind of building a movement from the back end forward. So for example, in a sprint, you might take a look at this from the perspective of starting the sprint with acceleration, right? So acceleration precedes the transition in max velocity. So in those training periods where you're doing really high volumes of work, at lower intensities and the athlete's ability to rapidly produce force is lowered, it might be a really good idea to work on emphasizing the proper direction that they're orienting those forces. So getting an athlete, particularly somebody like a soccer player who stands straight upright instead of accelerating for a longer period of time, that might be a really good point in time to give them something like a sled toe at like 30 or 40% body mass. Because what it's been, what's been, recently shown is that those heavier loaded sled sprints actually orient those forces in a more horizontal direction. Interesting. So when you're able to do that, now all of a sudden you go to the second phase of training 
they have a more efficient first three steps of their acceleration and you've sequenced things now nicely. So that way the second half of their sprint might be quote unquote potentiated, right? So uh, procedural memory development is just pretty much getting them to the point where you're teaching the athlete uh, the first pr- part of the procedure, essentially the first part of the sprint to potentiate the second part of the sprint. It just so happens that physiologically it kind of aligns with what you're doing in the weight room at that time. Yeah, that's terrific. And you know, as athletes move into that second phase, in your experience working in so many different sports, um, you know, how does that look in terms of how it might be different between one athlete, one sport versus another? Is it, is it still somewhat similar in tra- terms of how you would progress that? Or, or is there some changes now as you get into that second phase? There are definitely more changes. And like everything else, you know, everybody works general to specific, right? So in the beginning, to be honest with you, almost every single athlete, I would argue every single athlete would benefit from doing basic acceleration work, right? And obviously it might not be super sport specific to have a uh, soccer player come out of a crouch start because that's not something that's super sport specific. However, I'd argue that the first three steps of acceleration from a standstill will still give you a massive benefit from reaccelerating out of a change of direction. So when you start progressing from the basic to the more specific, that's where you might start taking some of those basic things, kind of working the procedural memory development aspect of it and preceding uh, the skill based a little bit more on sports specificity. So while you might be dealing with some sort of acceleration or basic acceleration in the beginning of the training program, uh, as you get forward into the training process and a little further along, I mean, it's pretty much going to be dependent on the demands of the sport. For example, you have somebody like a soccer player, they spend most of their time reacquiring acceleration position. So it might be accelerating from coming on the move, change of direction, uh, unplanned changes of direction, whereas somebody like a volleyball player, that might be a little bit different. We might be focused more on um, accelerating from different positions out of a different type of change of direction. So it really does take on a little bit more context specificity and sports specificity the further into the training process you go. Absolutely. I mean, definitely something with basketball players is uh, you know probably similar to volleyball players in terms of the different demands. Um, and how that might differ from sports like like soccer. And um, last year, I had uh, Derek Hansen on talking about you know sprinting. And um, I'll actually read another quote here from a paper you sent over because it sort of dovetails into what he had mentioned, which is you know contrary to intuition, fast and slow runners take essentially the same amount of time to reposition their limbs when sprinting at their different respective top speeds. Hence, the time taken to reposition the limbs in the air is not a differentiating factor for human speed. Rather, the predominant mechanism by which faster runners attain swifter speeds is by applying greater forces in relation to body mass during shorter periods of foot ground force application. Um, Awesome, Chris. Can you break that down as well for listeners and talk about stride length and stride rate? Heck yeah, man. As uh, Peter Wayans quote, I believe, from uh, 2000, and that was an awesome paper. And one of the things that comes out of that paper is just the relationship between kinetics and kinematics. And uh, Dr. Ken Clark, I was fortunate enough to have him on uh, my dissertation committee. He was my outside committee member, uh, has a phenomenal paper out there uh, linking the relationship between kinetics and kinematics. And what's been pretty clear is that there is a strong relationship between the way an athlete produces force and the kinematic outcome. And if you take a look at the way somebody produces force, for example, a soccer player, um, while their their swing time of their leg isn't all that different, because they tend to sprint more upright, the, the way that they strike the ground, it's a little bit more vertical in nature. So they don't accelerate as much uh, in those first three steps as well as somebody like a track and field athlete. Obviously, a track and field athlete is going to have a much more anterior lean torso. So the way that those guys produce force will out just across the board change the way that they move kinematically. And uh, I actually saw that in my dissertation and I'm still in the process of publishing the third paper. But one of the things I did was I actually compared these sprint kinematics um, or different sprint metrics, uh, such as step length, step frequency and ground contact time between stronger soccer players and weaker soccer players. And the interesting thing was For soccer players, there was actually no statistical difference in stride length between stronger and weaker players. Where the where the uh, the big difference seemed to show up was step frequency was a lot higher and ground contact time was a lot lower. 
And, you know, surprise, surprise, the stronger athletes were faster. We kind of knew that going in. I wanted to figure out why. So mechanistically, the way that they put force into the ground changes the way that they, uh, they manifest their sprint metrics. So there is a definite relationship between the two. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely fascinating stuff. And especially, with, you know, as you get further down the rabbit hole, trying to understand how all this is playing out. And, you know, if we zoom back out a little bit for, for listeners and trainers, um, you know, maybe you can give a few examples of, you know, acceleration, max velocity and speed maintenance exercises that uh, um, folks could, could, could use or implement with their clients. Sure. I mean, I think really just like anything else, it's kind of similar to the weight room. Everybody agrees that the basics work. Um, you know, if you're talking about resistance training, the vast majority of athletes and coaches, they agree that a squat and a deadlift are beneficial. If you get really good at the basics, things like a sled toe, things like teaching an incline sprint well, those are all things that will massively be beneficial to an athlete's acceleration, you know, and those are things that you could sprinkle in throughout the course of the training year. So my big staples that I typically use are sled towing as well as incline sprinting, particularly early in the training process. I don't think you can go wrong with those for just about any athlete. And mind you, they like anything else, they have to be coached well. For sure. But those are definitely my bread and butter in terms of my acceleration. Um, in terms of the change of direction, uh, just like anything else, landing mechanics, right? I mean, that's kind of step one. And there's a, a an easy progression. I think uh, Lauren Landau's done a great job at the last few uh, NSCA conferences, kind of revealing his uh, deceleration and change of direction progression. Which, to be honest with you, it's just fairly logical. Progressing from landing mechanics to planned change of direction to unplanned changes of direction. Um, it's more so about the actual sequence in which you put the drills than the drills themselves that are important. Now, I know you've worked with a lot of you know, athletes, NHL players, and of course, guys like P.K. Subban from the time he was in the OHL to one, an all-star in the NHL. Uh, can you take us through some of your fundamentals in terms of building strength and power in terms of whether it's exercise selection or uh, you know, sets, reps, etc.? My fundamentals are pretty simple. My guys, they squat, they pull, they press, they sprint, right? A lot of chin-ups, a lot of squats, a lot of pulls. And a lot of sprints, acceleration work. That's that's the foundation of our work. Um, we utilize Olympic weightlifting every day in our system, not just for power output, but for mobility. Uh, flexibility is huge. Stability as well. Um, one thing, one of our key exercises that athletes use, and they will tell you, and coaches that we've taught in our athlete activation system courses. The biggest thing they take away is the muscle snatch to overhead squat, which is on my website. If anybody wants to go and take a look at it, athleteactivation.com, there's a PDF and it outlines the muscle snatch to overhead squat, which is one tool we use to increase mobility, stability. It's huge, the difference that we see when someone walks in a gym day one, can't even get the, their bar, their shoulder their bar over their head in the slot the shoulder girdle is so tight ankles are so tight hips are tight um, no core strength no stability and at the end of the uh, summer they're doing reps with 40 kilos with a muscle snatch understand muscle snatch is not a dynamic movement it's a we it, you do not jump you right and so that opens the athletes up you know we you know there's a sprinter uh experiment that works here that uh just joined us and he, he's playing football and he couldn't believe how much his stride length has opened up we're at the track and his stride length has opened up so much he's take he's at every start he's his drive phase the horizontal phase is just the stride he's the amount of ground he's taking up with every step is incredible once he hits that the vertical stance and starts moving he, he's just eating up ground and that's all due to one exercise muscle snatch to overhead squat and uh, that's a great exercise that uh, some per body uh, an athlete uh, everyday person will help improve mobility flexibility and dexterity yeah, I mean, it's amazing how, like you said, we can use movement as a way to open up and improve mobility, flexibility. I know, you know people are still stuck into a lot of the myths around stretching to improve mobility. Um, mm -hmm. can, you, can you touch on that and the, 
the limitations or if there the benefits if there are of, of static stretching? You know, I, I I don't. There's nothing. I don't have a problem with stru- static stretching. Um, it's just I believe you know there's a right time uh, for everything. I believe in priming your body for the work you're about to do. So try to keep the work specific. And let's say in terms of mobility, the craze. What drives me crazy is, and I see it all the time. You have these uh, athletes who do the, all these crazy mobility drills or classes or whatever you want to call them or movement stuff. And then they're weak in that range of motion. The muscle snatch the overhead squat or they're weak in that new range of motion they have achieved. It is, that is a car accident waiting to happen. That is an injury waiting to happen. You have to get strong in the new positions and you have to understand what your sport requires how much mobility does your sport require because if you have too much you could be in trouble so for instance let's go back to the muscle snatch overhead squat we want our athletes to open their hips sit in a bottom low position uh no daylight within their hamstrings and calves or touch they're sitting deep in a squat now they start with the bar, which is, or a broomstick, which weighs two pounds, not even two pounds, a pound. And they'll work all their way up to 40 kilos doing, and that's their warm up. In our system, our athlete trains four days a week. That's their warm up four days a week. First thing they do, they'll do some warm up exercise on the, on the floor. They grab a bar and they'll do muscle snatch and overhead squats, warm up all the way to 40, 40 kilos where they're doing reps. That's the baseline. If you cannot do that, that's a problem, okay? And then we, we'll start from there. Then our athletes will go into more dynamic work for snatches, power cleans, whatever, whatever it calls for the day, cleans and squats and so on and so forth. So the reason we are increasing flexibility, mobility, under load which is huge yeah that's terrific i mean definitely having systems and standards like you mentioned is is so key to progressions especially with athletes um and if we shift gears a little bit and just talk about athletes that are perhaps have some significant limitations you know i work with basketball players quite a bit and ankles are really stiff they, their squat patterns are poor uh, t-spine stiffness are there ways to adjust some of the movements or how would you go about uh let's say you know basketball player came in um with some of the olympic movements would uh, are there modifications regressions or is it more just like you said getting back to the basics with things like the muscle snatch yeah it's everything starts i found that everything starts with the muscle snatch it's, a, it's amazing like the the tool is the overhead squat everybody's familiar with the overhead squat i've just taken in another step doing the muscle snatch because the ro- work in the ro- rotator cuffs you see all these guys uh all internally rotated playing xbox all day uh <laughs> not do, sure. no, not doing any posture chain work so what i've done is included the muscle snatch which works the external rotators then they, they have to fix the bar overhead which has to activate the stabilizers so hold the bar overhead and stretch the tissues in the, the subscapular rotator cuff and so on to hold that bar overhead and then with that bar overhead they have to do a squat right so what we do is we just slowly work that range of motion within their limitation uh slowly and we progressively load i've had basketball players come in t- uh, tight as a g- guitar string by the time they're they are I, I mean literally can't even put a, a dowel uh, 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 a pvc pipe over their head yeah that sounds about right <laughs> that, that's like literally and cannot sit in a they can't even do a go to a parallel squat their ankles are so tight you know they they can't even get their knee over their toes so we have to use a wedge board to to get the pattern going and open it up so it's it's work it's and that's why we i do that exercise every day muscle snatch overhead squat every day repetition is the mother of all learning to get the tissues to work you have to repeat it over and over and we have such a little small time with these athletes and that's a stand that i've used and i've i use muscle snatch to overhead squat as a as a as a mobility uh tool and, that, and we do it every day before they start training. So the progressions will start with a PVC pipe stick, 
uh, wedge board under heels, trying to achieve the correct positions. And we just slowly work it day by day until we until they hit, achieve the right positions. And uh, some basketball players are just amazed. You'll just turn around one day. Wow, they're sitting in the full squat. Bang, they're, they're, the bar is in the right slot. Bang, 40 kilos overhead. Um, shoulder girdle is nice and tight, stabilized, locking up. Upper back strong, lower back strong, you know. So it, it, it's huge, huge. Yeah, I mean, that would be that'd be great. I mean, last year I had Dr. Martin Cabal on the podcast, and of course he talked a lot about the history of HIT training and a lot of the traditional methods of programming, but I think it'd be great to get listeners on the same page here by describing some of those yeah, those key areas that could be targeted with HIT training. Yeah, cool. So, and I, I don't know, I haven't seen too many too many out there really take this approach. And, and uh, again, credit to Martin Bichette for, for this, uh, this idea, but uh, and I think as you know, it's Einstein when he said, uh, you know, everything should be made uh, as simple as possible, but no, but no, no simpler. So we really kind of yeah, take uh, hit training. Yeah, we really take hit training down into three key, um, I guess, targets that you can that you can get after when you're doing any sort of uh, interval training program. So one is uh, one that's kind of broken down to two is that metabolic aspect, and I'm sure you know, I'm pretty sure your listeners will be aware of. Within metabolism, there's there's generally aerobic and anaerobic components of that. So those are really the first two. So the uh, you know a, a hit session is going to have a, an aerobic oxidative component as uh, as as one uh, key target that you could be uh, you could be going after for your session. Uh, two, it could be having a, an anaerobic glycolytic type uh, type target, uh, and then the third one that's not always appreciated, but but it is it's definitely is with the the team sport individuals they they know about this one but it's the neuromuscular and uh, musculoskeletal mechanical type strain that occurs in various hit sessions you'll, you'll know that dr buds for, bubs from your um your, your basketball kind of uh sure. programming and whatnot right like there's the there's pretty high neuromuscular musculoskeletal damage and demands with with any type of basketball sort of training so that needs to be managed accordingly so it, what winds up uh, happening is you can break the the hit sessions down into i guess those three uh those three targets and you can have different degrees you're always going to get a blend of everything but you but you can have like a, a so sometimes it's weighted a little bit more in favor of one versus the other one one's dominating versus the other or you can have them all dominating and that winds up creating six types of, of um, target types, we call them, when we're, per, when we're trying to plan out an interval training program. And I'll just take you through those. I'll just list them. So the very first one, and I'll try to give you some examples as well as we kind of go through these, these, these different types. So we'll, we'll call it five, five target types, five hit target types that I'm going to list here. And there'll, there'll be a sixth one at the end, but it's not actually technically hit. I'll explain that one last. So the type, type one of, it, of uh, hit training is really that first, um, it's, it's a type that's really just going to be oxidative. Uh, and it's not going to be eliciting uh, too much of a neuromuscular strain. And it's not going to be eliciting too much of an anaerobic glycolytic load. And how you might do that is, um, is re having actually really short interval session so what winds up happening is if you're if you're having like little 10 second bouts of high intensity i, sh I we should actually also um, not forget to define high intensity interval training we're talking Definitely. about exercise that is performed kind of in your red zone um so you know above that uh, the so-called anaerobic threshold right so that's it's, yep. it, you know we we often and we we get that confused a lot but, um especially me and my uh you know i've got an iron man triathlon kind of background and forte and a lot of the sessions that um that my iron man guys do are kind of uh, they're more in they're, they're below what would be called the red zone or the anaerobic threshold they're more in that aerobic threshold kind of zone sometimes and they're they're efforts but they're not high intensity interval training high intensity interval training is really above that critical power or critical speed or or um uh lactate threshold so to speak um so it's when there's there's really um, anaerobic metabolism is going to start to be turning on if you help, if you, if you hold it up there too long. So back Perfect. to type one, type ones, remember aerobic oxidative. Now these are, so 
the the intensity is is up there. It's around the VO two max type um, uh, intensity. So it's it's hard work, but it's only on for like ten seconds or so, ten or fifteen seconds, and then you turn it off for another ten or fifteen seconds. And if you repeat that, what's really interesting is that you don't wind up getting too much of a glycolytic load, and you don't mind up getting uh, wind up getting too much neuromuscular strain. Um, but eventually, if you keep repeating those 10 on, 10 offs at that high intensity, you will start to raise heart rate. You will start to um, uh, get, uh, you know, an oxidative uh, contribution to the muscles uh, yeah. and, and a cardiovascular load. Um, just stay with it, right? You'll you'll see. And and that can be, um, I guess, yeah, it's, it's, it's I guess, um, when we're going from type 1 to type 5, we're going in, in order from low to high um, I guess strain overall, overall strain or stress, if you want to uh, d- describe it like that. So terrific, yeah. That, that's the that's the type ones, and you could you could imagine, you know, especially in the ba- basketball con- context, how you could do that type of type of conditioning. You could do it with ball work, and uh, but yeah, it's just it's you know ten or fifteen on and ten or fifteen off, and just keeping the but keeping the glycolytic and the uh, the neuromuscular um, strain load at that point in time. And prof for people in the team sport side of things is you know some strategies like um, if they're outside you know running on grass or just using regular um, you know sneakers rather than cleats are those also strategies to help with uh, reducing that neuromuscular demand? Absolutely, you got it. So that was and as we move actually that that's a great segue to move into type twos because um, now if we move into the type twos we could um, change the terrain. Now type twos have both that same aerobic oxidative uh demand but now we're getting some neuromuscular strain into it as well we're bringing that up and exactly as you said it's uh, now we're, we're we're bringing on um you know we might might have a little bit of change of direction in there the the um the pavement might be hard as opposed to being on grass uh or it would be running as opposed to cycling cycling would be low um, neuromuscular musculoskeletal strain and uh, of course the running and change of directions is going to be higher uh, neuromuscular musculoskeletal strain for sure and, shuttles jumps and all that stuff you got it, it all those different things so th- those are all would, would all be kind of considered a type 2 target for your for your programming um, and that yeah that's that's really about it and and then again continuing on down the uh, down the down the road we move to the type 3 one and uh, the type three, we have a high, you know, aerobic oxidative. We also now have a high anaerobic glycolytic contribution, and we have a low neuromuscular uh, or musculoskeletal strain. So in this one now, we're we're going the opposite way in terms of the the musculoskeletal strain. We're taking all those things off. We just added for the type two, or yep. it could be a could be a cycling workout, could be a grass grass running, could have low changes of directions, no jumps. But now we're adding on, uh, we're lengthening out the time at that high intensity, for example. So it's high intensity, longer durations. Now we're up and around you know, 20, 30, 40 seconds up, uh, you know, almost towards a minute. And now it, you'll, what, what you'll find with these when they're repeated is now we're really sort of, uh, we're adding into the, um, uh, the glycolytic uh, system. And we're, we're, you know, I guess we see a lot of lactate buildup at this point in time. So, yeah. So, and, and again, this, you, you can imagine this in your, in, in certain contexts as being certainly very important because, um, there's, you know, loads of different, uh, sports that require, um, those types of kind of durations and both of those systems to be, uh, to be functioning and working very well to, to need to train those. Yeah. Great, great way to work some of those systems, like for, for ice hockey, for example, without having to strain that neuromuscular system. Right. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. But um, for sure, and and I guess that's the key thing as well is that the, these all these three targets they're going to have kind of different time courses in terms of their recovery, uh, and and that and probably the one that's that's harder to hardest to play with uh, is that neuromuscular one, and that's why a type three can be really valuable um, if you're doing a type three session that doesn't have a low or sorry, it doesn't have a high neuromuscular strain. It can be kind of still really quite valuable to have programmed in because yes, you're, um, yes, you've got a, a solid, um, glycolytic load happening and an oxidative load, but 
it's limited in terms of the neuromuscular strain and you can still recover that system if uh, any sort of neuromuscular um, whatever has either been before it or or needs to be fresh fresh for something that's like a performance coming after it definitely um, yeah and then the, the the next one is uh, we call this one our weapons of mass destruction uh, <laughs> interval target and that's the for type sure. four and this is all out and that so that's uh, everything's everything lit is, up. everything's lit up there your oxidative your glycolytic and your um, your neuromuscular musculoskeletal and uh, the, a really good example for this one might be your um, a lot of people know what VO2 max intervals are so it's kind of it's kind of balls to the wall for two to four minutes um, and then it's yeah pretty grueling efforts. Pretty, you know, um, and they're, they're, they're hard, but I mean, again, in the right context. So, you know, we'll use these for our, our runners, our, our triathletes, our cyclists, especially towards the sort of the peaking end and where they need to be able to uh, prepare for um, events that are, that are that, you know, that's right in their wheelhouse, right? Like they need to be good at that. Definitely. So, um, yeah, so those are, um, again, but, but that is sort of the type four session. You're going to probably fit... Um, You'll feel it afterwards, but yeah, everything's lit up, and it's it's you're all in kind of thing for for those repeated efforts. And VO two max is a great one. Uh, and prof, that. Is, is that um, you know oftentimes now in, uh, in in football, soccer, as they we call it back back in America, uh, back yeah. home, um, a lot of the small sided games that they use now in, in training and practice would that be a type four as well for for this type of uh, hit session? Well, it de- it really depends. Right? Again, smaller uh, some, spaces and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, um, game-based interval training or small-sided games is is one of those ones where I think you you can have uh, generally type two through type four targets on any of those. It really just depends on how creative how you want to get with your with your small-sided game. That's right. But certainly your traditional, I think your traditional small-sided games would be would be falling into that uh, that type four category. Absolutely. Yeah, but again, if you um, if you, you know, you could still do a, t- a type three session if you, um, uh, if you coordinated it so that it didn't have a lot of changes of directions, you know, it was done on the pitch if it, and it was done, uh, at the right sort of, sort of time course. Um, uh, it, you could do it in sand. So there's different, there's different sort of ways to take off that neuromuscular strain, maybe more challenging in, in some contexts, but, but it can, it can be done. And, and same with the type twos as well with small sided games, you could really just take the breaks down. So it's like, um, yeah, it's a very, very sort of quick, quick games, but it's like there's, um, they're, they have the exact same sort of sequencing, um, in the type two category as, as we said before with that shorter, you know, 10, 15 seconds sort of on and 10, sort of 10, 10, 15 seconds off. Yep. So that's, that's still sort of possible depending on how creative you want to get with your programming. Thank you for listening to the Dr. 